Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. After Moses, the Lord's servant, died, the Lord spoke to Joshua Nun's son. He had been Moses' helper. My servant Moses is dead. Now get ready to cross over the Jordan with this entire people to the land that I am going to give to the Israelites. I'm giving you every place where you set foot exactly as I promised Moses. Your territory will stretch from the desert and the Lebanon as far as the great Euphrates River, including all Hittite land up to the Mediterranean Sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you during your lifetime. I will be with you in the same way I was with Moses. I won't desert you or leave you. Be brave and strong because you are the one who will help this people take possession of the land which I pledge to give to their ancestors. Be very brave and strong as you carefully obey all the instruction that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't deviate even a bit from it either to the right or to the left. Then you will have success wherever you go. Never stop speaking about this instruction scroll. Recite it day and night so you can carefully obey everything written in it. Then you will accomplish your objectives and you will succeed. I've commanded you be brave and strong, haven't I? Don't be alarmed or terrified because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Here ends the reading, Spirit of God, stir up your people. Thanks be to God. I want to begin with a confession. I don't want to give this sermon this morning. I don't want to preach on Joshua, especially on today of all days. It is hard while we watch war unfold in our world to preach to you about a book that is an account of one group of people utterly destroying another group of people for the sake of expanding their territory. And the whole thing is made even worse in my mind when the words of destruction that we have here in the Bible are put in the mouth of a God I understand to be loving. It's even worse because the book of Joshua includes narratives of individuals being punished when they fail to live up to this order of complete destruction. But beloved, this is the book of the Bible that we're at. And this is in fact a book in our Bible. It's been preserved for a reason throughout history. And as much as we may wanna skip over this part or erase this part, as much as we don't wanna deal with the things that make us uncomfortable, it is my sincere belief that we are not those kind of Christians. So, together, let us be strong and courageous and delve into what God has for us today with the full expectation that this Holy Spirit will move in this place and that something amazing will happen. Joshua, as a person throughout the Old Testament, is a follower of Moses. He is one of the faithful spies. If you remember, when they first cross the desert and they're on the precipice of the promised land after six months, a year, something like that, originally, Joshua is sent as one of 12 spies to the promised land, and he is one of two that comes back and says, we can do this, we can take this. The other faithful spy is, of course, Caleb. But they're outvoted by the other 10 spies and the people decide to wander in the wilderness. Well, they they don't decide to wander, right? They say, no, we're not going to go fight this fight. And God says, okay, now you can wander and die off. But Caleb and Joshua are preserved in this journey. And Joshua serves as Moses' assistant in the wilderness. And now he's been appointed as Moses' successor. The book of Joshua is identified as a piece of Deuteronistic history. I can't even say it. There's so many syllables in that. It includes the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, and 1st and 2nd Kings. It's just a piece of history of the establishment of the nation of Israel from the conquest onward that carries the added thoughts and words about being obedient to the law of God. That's the only reason we categorize those things together. So let's take a minute and go through some of the stuff that happens in the book of Joshua. So we're all on the same page. We already read that Moses has died and Joshua is now receiving orders from God directly. And then Joshua goes forward and hands off those orders to the people. I should say the big chunks of the book are very simple. First, 
it's the conquest, then it's the allocation of land, and then it's Joshua's farewell speech. That's the book in a whole shebang. But in the midst of this conquest, we have some interesting narratives that hop out. Like notice, Joshua also sends spies into the land, but he only sends two. I love that, right? It, things, details like that in the Bible are almost never an accident. The fact that two faithful disciples came back from the first spy trip and Joshua sends two spies the second time around is not an accident. Joshua is being strategic or the authors of the Bible are being strategic. The spies go to Jericho and we're told that they go to the house of a prostitute. No comment. Rahab turns out to be awesome. She protects the spies and helps them get out of Jericho safely when they're discovered. And because of her protection and her faithfulness, she joins, she and her family join the people of Israel. And in Christian teaching, Rahab is a part of the genealogy of King David and, of course, then Jesus Christ. I did read in doing research that some Jewish teachers believe that Ra this particular Rahab marries Joshua, and their line gives birth to prophets, including the Old Testament prophet of Jeremiah, because Joshua is the tribe of Ephraim, and David and Jesus come from the tribe of Judah, hence the debate. So the spies get out because of Rahab's work, and then we get the crossing of the Jordan, the waters part, the ark goes ahead. We build a couple altars, one in the middle of the river, one on the other side of the river as a marker of what God has done in this place. And then we get this renewal of the covenant by every adult, every male in the land of Israel being circumcised because we found out there were no circumcisions performed in the wilderness. There's a celebration of Passover. And then we go to the Battle of Jericho. And who doesn't know about the Battle of Jericho? The people are commanded to walk around the city once a day. And then on the seventh day, they walk around seven times. And then the shofar or the trumpets were blown and the walls collapse. But somebody in the camp takes something and keeps something they're not supposed to. So Israel immediately experiences a defeat after Jericho. And then we have this whole process of discovering who the sinner was and the sinner and his family are punished. And then the conquest continues, moving east to west. With a break of Gibeonites who lived in the land, playing a trick on the Israelites and being allowed to survive because of a covenant that they make together. There's more fighting. And in one of the fights, Joshua has this moment where he commands the sun to stand still. And we're told that the sun does so that Israel can finish their battle and claim victory. At chapter 13, the narrative flips. Joshua is now old and we're allotting out land to each of the tribes of Israel and there's long descriptions about borders. But one of the things that we notice or one of the things I hope you notice if you haven't read it yet is as the borders are described, there's this little addition of, but the people who were already there weren't actually driven out and they still exist alongside Israel to this day. Hold on to that. It's gonna be important later as we talk about all this stuff. The borders go on for a couple chapters. There are discussions of the refuge cities, which they were told to put in, the cities for the Levites. And then the very last chapters of the book of Joshua is Joshua's warnings to Israel and his commitment to serve God. And it's where we get one of those verses of the Bible. There seem to be verses of the Bible that everybody just loves. And the end of Joshua gives us, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? Joshua makes this commitment in the midst of the people and invites them to make the same commitment with a serious heart. Now, I cannot preach on this book without talking about what we do with the violence in the book of Joshua and Judges and First and Second Kings. And the reason for that is I spent much of my ministry up until I got here doing youth ministry and working with young adults. And I don't do it here because Shane rocks and I don't want to do his job. So I don't do it here. But I worked with youth and young adults and every single time, Joshua and Judges and the violence contained therein is a stumbling block for our students. 
And I imagine it's a stumbling block for our adults too. So what the heck do we do with the fact that in our Bible, as it's recorded, God says things like, utterly destroy this town, kill everybody in it. Now, let me give you a little bit of a warning about where we're headed. I don't have a perfect answer for you. This is wrestling, okay? So let's wrestle with it a little bit. Theories that I've heard about this book from other scholars, even within the book, the stories about the conflict and the conquest do not agree with each other. How much destruction actually happens, how many people are actually killed, it's conflicting in Joshua. So when we think about this as history, maybe we're not talking about a 100% historical document like we're used to getting, like a news report. The other thing scholars invite people to remember is the way people act in war, something that we're seeing unfold in our world right now. When you find out the enemy army is advancing on your town, what do you do? You send off the vulnerable, right? If you can, the women and the children and the old and the sick are evacuated before the army gets there. And so the assumption by some of these scholars is that that's exactly what the people of Canaan did. So by the time the Israelites get to the town like Jericho, the only people they find there are fighters, combatants. The other thing people point out is, believe it or not, there's little archaeological evidence to support the account of Joshua. When you dig and through cities and do archaeological work, usually you can trace the timeline of a city through layers in the dirt. And there is no evidence that Jericho ever had an experience where its walls collapsed completely and had to be rebuilt. So there's some question about, is this really accurate? Did it really go down this way? But the words are still there in our Bible, so what do we do with them? Honestly, some of us don't even deal with them, right? When's the last time you talked about or thought about Joshua, except for that, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, because it's such a great verse. Some people point out that it doesn't jive with the rest of the Bible. It doesn't jive with what the rest of the Bible tells us about the nature of God, especially when you include the New Testament. And frankly, it's unsatisfactory to me to have a theology that says God of the Old Testament is wrathful, God of the New Testament is loving. It's dismissive, it's kind of rude to our Jewish brothers and sisters. Somehow these things have to be cohesive, but people do that. They're like, it just doesn't work, so we're, meh, we're going to ignore it. Some people said that it was just a metaphor. It was a story that people told themselves at a bad time in order to make themselves feel better. And it was kind of like that playground jibing back and forth of like, my God can kick your God's butt and has. Right? What a great story. If you remember, we talked last week about exile, Babylon, being in exile in Babylon, and Babylon had their own gods. And if you're in exile feeling bad about yourself, how fun would it be to write a story of a time when, like, my God caused the walls to fall down with the blow of a trumpet? Ha <laughs> ha What do you think about that? That's a theory. The theory I heard about that I'm clinging to, it's still not great but it helps a little bit, is that when you really dig into Joshua, when you really read it line by line, detail by detail, you find out things like the word genocide isn't actually in there. God doesn't command genocide. If our English translations say genocide in it, it's lazy translation work. That the destruction that's actually described is focused around major cities, and the people in charge. The, the destruction that's commanded to happen is focused around what I would call cultic purity. We have to get rid of everything related to the maintenance of a religion that is not our own. Now, this is an interesting and kind of a foreign concept for us. We don't have this same idea of like holiness being contagious, but have you noticed it in the Old Testament? It would be like me saying to you that if you walk up here and touch the pulpit, you've caught preaching. You're now a preacher. 
Some of you would like run screaming from the pulpit. That's not how it works. Some of you might be called to preach, but you, you can't catch it just by touching the pulpit. But there is this idea in the Old Testament that if you had something like our crosses, right, something beautiful like our cross that's gold and it's dedicated to the worship of God, if you were to come up and handle it, you would have caught holiness like it's contagious. And so if you touch something that's dedicated to the worship of another god, say Baal or Molech, then you would have caught that like intention of it. It would stick to your skin and change your very being. And so all of this stuff has to be destroyed or purified in fire in some way. Like I said, I don't have a good answer for you. But we have to find a way to deal with this book. We have to have some thoughts on it. And also, I want to give you permission to say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to deal with it. I'm still wrestling with it myself. But the question I hope you're all asking is, well, that's great, Alexis, but what do I do with it right now? What do I do with Joshua right now? And that I do have an answer for. When I first got into ministry, my sister... Um, went to, my little sister, she's awesome, she went to see this speaker who was another Methodist, and she told him how I was going into ministry and feeling a little stressed about it because I was so young. I was 23 years old when I first started in ministry, if you can believe it. I had the, like, high school, college, seminary, started working pipeline. And I was 23 years old, and I was feeling really self-conscious about being in ministry, And she told this leader about it, um, I think because sometimes she likes to tell embarrassing stories about me, but it turned out to be a good thing. And he wrote her a letter to give to me that was based entirely on the opening pericope of Joshua. Young leader, be strong and courageous. You are called by God. Be strong and courageous in what the Lord God has called you to do. And I have the letter to this day. I meant to bring it with me, but, you know, I have small children, and sometimes mornings don't go the way you want them to go, and so the letter is somewhere at home still. I never did have time to find it, but it exists. Be strong and courageous. And so the takeaway for us, in my mind, from Joshua, is this idea that when we are obedient to God, Because that's another vein that runs through this story, right? When we are obedient to God, when we talk about God's laws, when we think about them, when we lay down, when we think about them, when we get up, when we talk about them to everyone around us, when we're obsessed with God has to say, when we're listening closely to what the Spirit of God is calling us to do, then, then God is going to do miraculous things in us and through us. Then we will see walls fall down at the blow of a trumpet. Then we will see the sun stand still and we will accomplish impossible things. And make no mistake, God has impossible things that he has called us as a church and us as individuals to. But it is only as we obey and as we stay grounded in the word of God that we will see these impossible things, these miraculous things accomplished. Amen? Amen.